Hello and welcome to Field Notes on Climate Change, the podcast from the front lines of Arctic research based at the Arbusco Scientific Research Station in northern Sweden. I'm Emma and in this episode I'm heading out to where the edge of the shrinking Arctic tundra meets the growing birch forest and covering myself in insect repellent because the summer is here and the massive local mosquito population have discovered that they can bite through hiking trousers. I'm joining Tom Parker and Jens Subka from the University of Stirling and Lorna Street from the University of Edinburgh for a day out in the field as part of the Primetime project looking at the emissions of carbon from different Arctic soils. The reason we're interested in the soil out here in the Arctic is because there's masses of carbon locked away in the peat soils in the tundra. The team want to know if changes to the peat and the permafrost in the tundra, thanks to climate change, will cause more of this carbon to be released into the atmosphere. So Tom, the processes that are going on underground in Arctic soils and the storage of carbon within these is coming up more and more when we talk about climate change these days. I'm joining you and Jens and Lorna out in the field tomorrow, so can you give me a little introduction to your fieldwork? Yes, we are here to investigate how different plant types, be they shrubs or trees around the tree line, how they uh, influence soil carbon that they're currently growing on. So we're using them as a snapshot into the future. Uh, so in the future, you know, 50 to 100 years, we're going to start seeing a lot more shrubs and trees around the tundra, which is the treeless area. And even though they might be photosynthesizing more and drawing more carbon into leaves, uh, what they do with the carbon afterwards as they send it down into the roots is really an open question. And we're hypothesizing that this input of energy, this carbon energy into the soil, is actually going to stimulate the decomposition of soil carbon that's already there. So if we're looking at it from kind of a big picture perspective... Mm-hmm. You're wondering whether more soil carbon could be lost from the Arctic than would actually be sequestered from the atmosphere if we see an increase in tree growth? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, carbon has been accumulating in some soils for you know, hundreds, thousands of years. And it, for example, in the, in the Arctic and in permafrost regions, the soil stores twice as much carbon as is in the atmosphere. So... Um, you don't need to lose much of that to actually have quite a big release of carbon into the atmosphere. So presumably that could increase the rate of climate change if we're also increasing the rate of carbon that's being lost from the soil and the peat here? Yes, um, the actual magnitude of this change is something that we really don't know and uh, we really need to get to the bottom of the mechanisms by which plants control soil carbon to try and understand... the amount of release that we're going to we were going to have. Okay, so before we set off for the fieldwork site tomorrow, what does climate change research look like for you? Oh, good question. I would say that it's a complicated uh, mix of plants, soils, and ecosystems. So it's the flow of carbon through different parts of an ecosystem and how all of this responds to climate change and climate warming. So for me, climate change research involves going out into Arctic tundra environments and taking lots of soil samples, measuring how much carbon is in the soil and also measuring how much carbon is being released from the soil as greenhouse gases. So we go and take instruments and measure the flux of carbon dioxide. Um, We spend a lot of time outside and we get bitten by insects because we're always in the Arctic in the summertime. Um, And then a wee bit of lab work and a wee bit of quantitative modelling work using numbers in the back at the lab. For me, climate change research is understanding the interactions between the living world, the ecosystems, so anything from within the soil, what grows on the soil, what lives in and on the soil, how that interacts with um, the atmosphere, so that we have the, the physical environment, so the, the climate itself, how warm it is, how moist it is, influencing the living world and then this feedback of the processes that go on that lead for example to uptake of carbon in the in the ecosystems but also release of carbon or other greenhouse gases that then in turn influence the climate so i'm interested in these feedbacks and cause and effect or cause effect and feedback uh, of ecosystems and the climate system All right, I think that's enough studio time for now. Uh, I've met the team and we've introduced the wider questions that the project is asking. So now it's time to head into the field. 
so we've stuffed our rucksacks full of syringes and glass tubes and vials and all sorts really crossed some streams and marched through the countryside uh, for five or so kilometers to find the fieldwork site um, we're kind of surrounded by hundreds of mosquitoes but all in all the sun is shining and it looks like a lovely day for some sampling Okay, so Lorna, we've trekked for over an hour to get here. Tell me, why have you brought me here? So I'm, I'm a collaborator um, on the Primetime Project, and we are here to understand the impact of changing conditions on the carbon cycling in the Arctic. And that's important because there is a hell of a lot of carbon stored in um, Arctic permafrost and northern high latitude ecosystems in general. And it's all in the soil. And um, so that contrasts with if you go to the tropics for example you have enormous trees there's like tons of carbon in the trees and that's why we worry about deforestation uh you have an opposite situation in the arctic where you've got all this all the carbons in the soil and it's actually not that much in the trees so we want to know what's going to happen to that carbon in the future uh, because if we lose some of it some of that carbon from the soil to the atmosphere then that will worsen uh the situation that we have where we're adding our carbon emissions from human activities so that's why we're interested in it. Specifically, what we are looking at is trying to understand how changing vegetation will influence the carbon that's in the soil. So we know that the Arctic's warming and um, it's potentially, uh, the weather in general is potentially changing and that has an impact on how the plants grow. So obviously, usually plants struggle in Arctic conditions because it's really cold. Um, and we can now see the change in the vegetation from space and we can actually monitor that now over time using satellites you can see that the whole arctic biome is greener than it than it was so uh, as a result of human activity we've fundamentally altered an entire biome <laughs> the plants are growing more oh lorna did you have that orange knife or did you dump it oh, back in the lab bag. oh great uh can Just i in the top So Tom, uh, you guys have been working at this field site on and off uh, during the summers for a couple of years, but I'm pretty new to the area. So now that you've found your knife, um, I'm intrigued to see what you mean when you say you're going to give me a beginner's introduction into what's going on underground. Um, we're in the tundra, so the tundra being the treeless area of the Arctic. So if I dig down with this knife, cut out some soil. really really I haven't managed to cut all the way down but it's really really densely packed with peat so the carbon stored in this peat is you know 5 10 15 times more carbon that is stored in these plants oh, wow. so I could keep on digging but usually these soils are about 30 to 40 centimeters deep and all of this peat is the accumulation of dead plant material that has just simply not decomposed, it's just sitting there. So I can show you what the forest looks like. I'll put that back. So if we just stop here, we're now 20 meters away from where we dug that peat up. We do the same experiment, we dig down into this soil. one section of it. We've now got to the bottom of the peat profile and the amount of peat here is about half of what it is just 20 meters away wow. and the, basically the only difference between this and here is that there are trees. Okay, I'm going to step in for just a second. Tom's just given me a really nice analogy, actually. Uh, he says now that you can think of the carbon cycle in an ecosystem as a bank account. So trees and plants do photosynthesis and draw carbon into your bank account. And it's then stored for some time uh, and then it's used again. So when you spend it, it gets released back into the atmosphere. So in the tundra, uh, where we've got more stored carbon, the carbon dioxide and carbon release is much slower. So in the great ecosystem bank analogy, uh, the tundra is actually your savings account and it stores the carbon for much longer. 
Whereas in the forest, all of the extra carbon that's being drawn in by the trees uh, is released again pretty quickly. So this is kind of like your current account. So if the trees begin to grow in the tundra, more carbon from the ecosystem savings account, as it were, will be lost and not replaced as any new carbon brought in just ends up straight back in your current account, which is quite a nice way of thinking about it, I think. So anyway, back to Tom. We broadly want to know, as the climate changes around the Arctic and trees and shrubs, as they expand and expand their territories and grow more around the Arctic, what will happen to all this soil carbon? because as we look at ecosystems now, it seems that there's far less carbon stored in these forests. So as a worst case scenario, um, all of the carbon that's, or a lot of the carbon that's stored in that peat could be lost from the tundra. And that just goes straight up into the atmosphere? Potentially, yeah. Um, there's a lot of question marks and we're really starting to just feel our way with this. So we're, um, but at the moment we're trying to understand the mechanisms by which these trees interact with the soil. How are we actually testing it? Um, we've set up an experiment where we are taking leaves of this species, so this is mountain birch, which is the dominant forest species around here, and we grew it in an environment that has um, a heavy isotope, so 13 carbon. Most carbon in the environment is 12 carbon. So if you add a leaf that has this special label, you can determine of the carbon that's being released, how much is from the soil and how much is from the leaf. So we've, we've taken this, this labeled leaf material, which is a stable isotope, so it's, it's not dangerous in any way, uh, it's, um, and added it to the soil, and we're measuring the CO2 release um, as we add leaves, as we add labeled roots, so these different forms of carbon addition, we're hypothesizing at least, stimulates the decomposition of the soil that's already there. Okay, so we've lugged quite a lot of strange looking kit up here. Yes. This in particular, I've never seen before. Okay. What on earth is it? Uh, this little box is called an infrared gas analyzer. So it tells you the concentration of carbon dioxide in any air sample, um, and it uses an infrared uh, beam, basically a laser beam and CO2 absorbs uh, that beam of light at a certain wavelength. So this analyzer can be used to tell us how many parts per million of carbon dioxide are in, uh, in any bit of air. So currently it's giving 417 parts per million, which I think is only two parts per million off the global average. At the moment we're, we're at 415, I think. Um, what are we going to be using it for today? We're going to be using it to measure the production of CO2 from the ground. So the what's called soil respiration, which is the microbial community in the soil breaking down uh, soil compounds and producing CO2, just like we break down food and produce energy that we use to move around. They do exactly the same, but in the soil. And the product is carbon dioxide. So if we take this analyzer, and put this, what is essentially a bucket, onto the ground to build up the CO2 concentration as it's being produced, we can work out a rate of production. People often ask me, because I've been working in Arctic ecosystems for almost 20 years, I often get asked, do you see the change? Because right? the vegetation is changing, people want to know, can you see it when you go there? And the answer to that is usually no, because like it's so gradual. You know, even if even if the vegetation was changing, you'd you wouldn't be able to notice it because it's just a really gradual thing. But the one thing that I have noticed is that when we make our CO two flux measurements, the starting concentration on the instrument is higher than it was when I started my research career, which was about twenty years ago. And that is one thing which is very clear to see. And what does that mean? It means that we're changing. Well, the concentration in the atmosphere is going up. You know, we can see it when we make our measurements. So, for example, today we're starting at what four? Four hundred fifteen. And we passed. What? When did we pass four hundred ppm? How long ago was that? Uh, only about six years ago. Six years ago. Something like that. So, the ambient concentration, the natural con concentration in the atmosphere, before we start measuring what's coming from the soil, is higher than it was. So not only are we measuring the rate of carbon dioxide production in our plots, which is what we're using to calculate the rate of respiration, we're also taking samples of these gases. 
So Lorna set it up to collect the gas released and once the plot has been left for the required amount of time, Jens is on hand to take a sample of that gas. Hold your breath. So explain to me what you've just done and why you just made me hold my breath. <laughs> so we're collecting CO2 to analyse it for its isotopic composition because that tells us things about the processes that we need to know. But if you breathe into it before you put the sampling chamber on, then you'll have your breath in there and uh, it will all be contaminated and therefore wrong. So when I take a gas sample, I just sort of flush that briefly. And then I take 20 mils in here and the glass tube holds 12. So when I put the needle in there we can see the plunger is being drawn in from the vacuum and then we pressurize them so I put like I say I've got 20 mils in the syringe and I push that into a 12 milliliter volume so we end up with an, an overpressure which is kind of good in case there's a leak we're not the leak is outwards not inwards but hopefully we don't have leaks anyway. Mm. And what are you going to do with the gas samples that you've just taken? So these gas samples, they get shipped to a collaborator at the University of Hamburg. And they have an isotope ratio mass spectrometer. So they can determine the abundance of 12C and 13C, both of which are naturally occurring. Uh, first of all, they're stable isotopes, they're not radioactive isotopes. 12C is the, the common carbon, so when you look at a periodic table, mm -hmm you'll find carbon has got the mass of 12, molecular mass of 12. But about one in a hundred atoms, naturally, is a 13 carbon. So it's got a, another neutron, it's slightly heavier. But these mass spectrometers can resolve these really small differences in mass. The leaves that we've added to some of the plots are all marked with this heavy carbon-13 isotope. The results provided by the University of Hamburg will help tell us how much of the carbon released into the atmosphere from each plot is from the soil and how much of it has been released from these leaves as they decompose. Combining this with the respiration measurements from earlier, we'll be able to better understand whether an increase in leaf litter from an increased tree growth that we're expecting to see here in the tundra will firstly mean that more carbon is released into the atmosphere and whether that's being unlocked from the amount stored in the soil or whether it's coming from these leaves that are being dropped. Carbon isn't always released as carbon dioxide gas though, so it can also be released as dissolved inorganic carbon, in water essentially. So next up we are also running water through our plots. Okay, so you're actually letting me have a go with this one. Oh yeah, absolutely. You're fully working away as part of the team. <laughs> and what are we doing? So we are trying to extract water from the soil which is actually really hard in a wet in a very dry soil so we're having to pour water on it and then we are we have a tube kind of connected to the bottom of the soil and we're pulling it out with a syringe and then filtering it so i am well Lorna's pouring you're syringing out i'm filtering and then replacing the filters and we're working as a you know constantly turning over machine Having a third person to do this is so useful. So we've got all of our water samples now. Yes. What are you doing with them next? So next we are going to analyse how much carbon there is in the water, so how much we've lost from this soil, and then we're going to use the different isotopes um, the 13 carbon isotope that's in the added material and the 12 carbon isotope that's in the soil to work out which parts are being lost. And this will tell us eventually whether adding these different forms of new carbon, be it leaves or roots or dissolved carbon, increases the loss of carbon from the soils. So taking a step back a bit, we rely entirely as, a, as human society on predictions of how climate change is going to pan out to plan for what impact that's going to have. So we have these huge, com hugely complex models which forecast um, climate change, essentially. 
um, taking into account emissions, but also taking into account how the whole Earth system works and will respond to, to those changes. And at the moment, what those models predict is that if you warm the Arctic, make it greener, make it nicer for the plants, they will grow and they will take carbon from the atmosphere and store it in their tissues, in their biomass. And if they do that, the fact that they're taking up carbon from the atmosphere, that would be an, an ameliorating uh, change. So it would make climate change less bad, essentially. Um, but what we think in the Arctic is that actually if you change the vegetation, you change the biology um, of the soil, and you actually lose carbon rather than gaining it if you grow more plants. And the reason for that is because there's p potentially, we think, a direct link between how much uh, the plants are growing, essentially their demand for nutrients in the soil. So if it's easier to grow, the plants need more, um, need to take up more nutrients from the soil. And that requirement actually stimulates the decomposition of carbon that's currently in the soil. Uh, so the idea is that you might get more plant biomass, but less carbon overall. And so if that's true, the current models that we have to predict changes in climate are underestimating how much we need to reduce our emissions to achieve a certain climate objective. We're talking here about the difference perhaps between predicting maybe 200 billion tonnes of carbon being lost from the Arctic versus, I don't know, like 150 or 100 billion tonnes. Like we're talking about like, differences on the order of 100 or less than 100 billion tonnes, right? But that's how much we emit in 10 years. So, you know, what we really need to do <laughs> is stop the emissions more than anything else. <laughs> like the whole like carbon feedbacks part is significant because it changes the timings, it changes our predictions, it changes the predicted cost of our abatement efforts. But fundamentally, the apocalypse scenario is if we don't stop emitting carbon to the atmosphere from human activity, not from the Arctic. Crikey, well, what a note to end a field day on. It's a little scary to think that some of the global models that we're using to quite literally plan our futures are using, I mean, the best data available at the time, but data that still could be improved or incomplete. The positive here has to be that it gives real meaning and context to the work that teams like the Primetime Project are doing. But next up in this episode, I am heading back to the research station and I'm going to be having a chat with Phil Wookie from the University of Stirling, who set up the Primetime Project. So you've been working, or at least been working on projects up here in the Arctic for quite a long time now. Um, one of the nice things... <laughs> that makes me sound very old. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, one of the nice things you... Well, not nice. One of the things you talked to me about earlier was the first IPCC report that came out. Yeah, so I'll have to confess, yeah, I've been working in the Arctic um, since 1991. Uh, so over a quarter of a century. The first IPCC uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report came out in 1990. Mm -hmm. um, so, and the situation with that was that back in the day, uh, this was when uh, there was a, the, the first big concerted international effort to understand climate change and its potential role uh, in on planet Earth. And back then, uh, sceptics of climate change and its human uh, links uh, were effectively accusing the authors of the IPCC report of scaremongering. And in fact, now, uh, with the changes that have happened between uh, then and now, mm -hmm. it's become pretty clear that they were quite conservative in their estimates of change. So actually, the rate of things uh, changing, particularly things like Arctic sea ice decline, has been substantially more rapid than was predicted back then. Yeah, it's quite, it's, I mean, it, you know, it, it's, it, you know, without in any way, sort of like, you know, scaremongering, it's one of these things that in the time that I've been working in the Arctic, even here in Arbisco, um, I would say that things have changed dramatically. Uh, and only last year, we had uh, temperatures at this time of year, uh, the highest recorded in over a century of 32.7 degrees. There's and, some pretty uh, steep working conditions for the Arctic. That's very, it makes, it makes working here actually quite, quite tough, because... Yeah. Uh, we're still pretty much in the midnight sun period, mm. and so there's no escape. And if you're working out outside the trees, up in open heath and tundra ecosystems, you know you can't get away from that. No. And, uh, yeah. So so it's it, it is changing. 
been working in northern Canada as well, in Northwest Territories in recent years, and uh, there's no question there that the temperature's gone uh, gone up by uh, two, two and a half degrees in the last uh, as many decades, actually. Uh, so there's not, if you talk to native people there, First Nation people there, uh, they'll, uh, there's no climate deniers in that community. No, they can, I guess, really paint this vivid picture of change, having watched it for so or so intensely and understood their landscape so well. Well, that's right, and they have there's there's direct sort of like implications for them and their lifestyle in terms of what what the hunting platforms might be in terms of ice cover uh, mm. offshore, in lakes and and in the sea, but also in terms of transport because very often in the winter they are actually using uh, rivers as the transport network, for example, and uh, there's incidents now where it's just simply not safe anymore uh, to to travel on those routes. Um, so yeah, things are changing very fast, and um, yeah, it's one of the, the things that's kind of interesting to have been involved in some of the research for that kind of length of time to mm. be able to see these things. So even though I'm not quite as as old as I look, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, so if we bring it back to this side of the Arctic, do you think there is anything that we can do if we focus on your project, you know, to protect our peat and our tundra and our permafrost? Well, it's, that's quite interesting. So effectively, on one level, uh, what we're, uh, we're, we're not necessarily through this work trying to come up with management options. I guess, you know, much of this research is, is, is fundamentally uh, curiosity driven. You know, I'm interested in these processes because I want to know the answer. Um, yeah, me too. But I, I mean, I, I hope, yeah, absolutely. But I hope that there are things that we can learn from it. Uh, but, uh, you know, one of the things might very well be that uh, you know, we don't necessarily always want to see uh, trees encroaching onto open spaces, uh, that be that the Arctic tundra or subarctic heaths, such as around here in Arbisco. Uh, that's something that potentially might have a counterintuitive consequences for, say, carbon cycling, even though we have more productivity and, and greener looking, uh, more biomass uh, plant communities, they might actually contain less carbon because there's less in soil. If we've accelerated the decomposition of the soil carbon, we might have actually reduced the the, the, the total stock of carbon in the system. So that's that, that's one aspect of it. Another thing is that the energy budget can change quite dramatically when you have trees compared to perhaps snow covered heath and tundra Mm -hmm. and that's particularly true sort of like you know early in the spring when the sun's returning here you have a darker surface Uh, if you have more trees it tends to mean that snow melts out faster yeah Uh, and there are issues like that as well so the energy budget question is quite important too and there's been other work that's been based there's been a nordic center of excellence that's actually been looking at the role potentially of large grazers such as reindeer in retaining open landscapes and thereby actually mitigating climate change by keeping sort of like you know open landscapes with uh, a nice uh, bright white snow cover uh, uh, so preventing through, the tree growth into preventing that. the tree encroachment yeah. yeah so there's there's quite a lot of you know interesting d- dimensions to this i mean another facet of this that could be very interesting to study is the extent to which perhaps the reindeer herding communities sort of like w- you know what what role uh, they see um, of climate change in their own activities and whether or not uh, you know shifting upwards boundaries of forests and so on is necessarily a good or bad thing for them so it's interesting there's all sorts of, sort of like pros and cons uh, in the mix but uh, if we found out for example that uh, you know these systems and the soil carbon in them was very vulnerable uh, to being lost to the atmosphere if uh, there was encroachment of mountain birch onto heath um then you know it, it might be uh, another argument in favour of trying to maintain these open communities and perhaps using grazing intensity as a method to do that. Yeah, that's not what I thought about. I was expecting a we all need to cut our emissions response. Uh, well, there's that too uh, as well. <laughs> but uh, that was that was much more interesting. Y- I'd never really thought about using reindeer and existing communities as a climate change mitigation response, but or land management tool even. Yeah, well, absolutely. Uh, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's part potentially of the solution. I don't think there's any, any simple solutions to no, some of these issues. So I think, um, you know, we have to know and try and understand what the, you know, how the system functions, how the Earth system functions in parallel with thinking about technological and behavioural, uh, you know, changes to uh, reduce carbon emissions to the atmosphere. So I think these things go in parallel. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are potentially ways of managing ecosystems to, to help help ourselves a little bit and that might be one of them is actually you know preventing ironically with so much discussion about uh, uh, reforestation of large areas of the planet mm. that kind of approach might be entirely sort of like uh, unhelpful in northern ecosystems um, so it might very well be a case of we're actually yeah we need to rem- we need to retain 
are currently 5 million square kilometres of Arctic tundra uh, because it has an important regulatory role in the Earth's climate, um, not only for for its role in in, in storing carbon, but also potentially the energy energy budget Mm. uh, dimensions to that as well, which you'd lose if you actually uh, plant trees all over it, or they encroach naturally. But of course, the latter process is going to take quite a long time as you can imagine that's not something that happens overnight they don't it's, just it, up it, and move do they yeah so i mean if you think you know if you thought about the uh, the situation perhaps in a tropical rainforest where uh it's been felled and you perhaps want to you know regrow um a secondary forest mm-hmm. you might find that in in 20 30 40 years you have significant advant- advantages in terms of carbon sequestration um, in a northern ecosystem such as this, uh, the time scales are going to be much longer uh, in terms of how the, the rate at which trees grow and so on. Mm. So it's something that perhaps to, you know, to consider for medium to longer term, but it's not a, a quick fix. No, not at all. Yeah. And what about in the UK? You and I are both you know, UK-based. We've got a lot of peat bogs um, and a lot of carbon stored in those, but we're losing those quite rapidly at home as well. Is there anything you think that maybe we could learn from your work and your thoughts out here to take back? Yeah, I think um, you're absolutely right. It, it, it's a sort of International Union for the Conservation of Nature has a very, very big emphasis on peatlands in the UK. And, uh, you know, of course, they're not only fascinating ecosystems in their own mm. right, uh, but they are important st- uh, stores for carbon. Um, and they potentially have a regulatory role, obviously, in the water cycle and uh, uh, in terms of discharge of rivers and so on and uh, reducing flooding risk down downstream. Um, but, yeah, I think the, the, the situation with wetlands in the UK is they're very, very very uh, um, useful and fascinating ecosystems. They're also very fragile. So I think the, you know, if we can re- recreate wetland systems and functioning wet- wetlands um, and prevent de- further degradation and damage to the existing ones, then that's probably on balance going to be a very good thing. Um, I think gone are the days. Thankfully, I think we've kind of learned from uh, you know, issues like back in the 1980s, planting Sitka spruce trees on uh, the flow country in Caithness and Sutherland. I think we've realised now that wasn't a good idea. Uh, you don't get very good tree growth and you certainly cause a lot of damage as well. Um, so well, I think they're precious ecosystems in the UK context and we need to keep them. That's not only kind of like your classic really wet wetlands, but things like blanket peatlands in our uplands as well in northern England, uh, Wales and Scotland. So they're very important systems. Another linked issue, I guess, comes to... And this is maybe something that you, you might, might have been thinking on the lines of, is there's obviously, again, a lot of pressure um, to political pressure as well to plant trees over a lot of our upland landscapes in the yeah. UK uh, in, in rewilding attempts. I think that has to be planned very carefully and we have to think about what the implications would be for, for carbon budgets and balances in those Certainly. systems. Mm. Um, there's also a kind of, you know, you know, what do we want as a society? You know, do we want, uh, you know, open landscapes in our uplands or do we want to try and recreate um, natural or, or as, as, as well as we possibly can based on our understanding of these systems, woodland uh, ecosystems as well. And I think there's a balance to be struck probably between those two. I think there's a great advantage. There's all sorts of reasons why we might want to recreate woodlands, mm. not just in relation to carbon stocks. Um, and I think we need to think more broadly, not just focus on one ecosystem service. Yes. Um, so I'd like to see, you know, large areas of uh, the UK uh, with kind of functioning woodland ecosystems. That doesn't necessarily mean that we keep people out. You know, obviously there's the the access issues, the multiple benefits for society, you know, health benefits and so on. But functioning working woodlands can also be uh, very, very important for wildlife and so on as well. So perhaps we coppice and, uh, Mm. you know, produce charcoal and things like this, you know, biofuel. It's not necessarily incompatible with maintaining vibrant and mixed forest systems too and creating employment for people. Definitely, yeah. Biodiversity is being another thing that we're, we're speaking about quite regularly at home. This is going completely off topic from soil, but I you're like right, trying topic. to maintain <laughs> trying to maintain landscapes that function as they would as if we hadn't bothered them in the first place. Um, to maintain biodiverse and productive ecosystems in general is something that we, we really need to... I think that's right. Into. I think you, you, it's very easy to be sort of like you know quite utilitarian about this, but I think that you know the the sheer psychological and health benefits to people mm. of knowing that though they might not even visit sort of like a nearby woodland, you know, every week, knowing it's there, yeah, 
um, and accessible, and that's to the full cross section of society. Um, I think has you know, immeasurable benefits actually in terms of health and psychological well-being, mm-hmm. you know, all of these issues. And I still, it, it can make my day. For example, I'm very, very fortunate to live where I do in the UK and in, in Scotland. Um, and I get to see sort of raptors flying around outside wow. my home. And uh, it makes my day just seeing a red kite flying by or something like that. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Uh, it's, it's just something that I... And perhaps not everyone thinks the same as me, but uh, genuinely, you know, if I take a walk in the Highlands and I see a golden eagle, you That's know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm just ec- ecstatic with that. I think You're it's sky brilliant. high as well. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Well, who knew what was going on underground could be quite so important? Uh, thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly had a wonderful day out with the team. Don't forget to hit subscribe so that you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes and please do leave a comment or two to let us know what you think. If you have any questions or you want to get in touch, you can tweet the Climate Impacts Research Centre at Arctic Cirque, reach me at Emma Brisian or check the show notes for other ways to get in contact. I'll see you soon for another episode of Field Notes. Music